tuned to Janet Cena Cablevision. Thank you for watching. It's time for talk. Each evening at this time, Monday through Friday, Rosemary interviews local personalities and others who bring items of interest to this community. Time for Talk is a community betterment service. Tonight, Rosemary takes us by means of portable camera out of our studios and maybe into your neighborhood. And now, it's time for Talk. Time for Talk has been collecting bits and pieces of history of this boot heel of Missouri for over 20 years. Uh, we have in this collection of tapes that you've seen, if you've been with us through the years, we have hundreds of tapes in this collection representing, um, oh, I wouldn't even begin to know how many programs or how many hours uh, that, that we've put into this. And we have come up with a concept of the boot heel revealed in these pictures, many of them, that would be very interesting. Uh, we've drawn heavily from histories. The two books you saw on the screen when we came on were only the beginning. We've consulted uh, courthouse records. We've consulted maps. There have been maps from uh, the Corps of Engineers, from uh, uh, the old vault in the basement of the courthouse. Those were fascinating to dig those up. We've gone up in the stacks at the courthouse and gotten maps of the original survey that was done in 1843. We actually tried to uh, capture that on drawing paper because at that time we had no other way to do it. But some of the other sources that uh, we have used have been biologists who've been in here to do certain research. There have been Actually, the priceless things are the interviews with some of the um, older citizens we've had. Um, we've enjoyed those tremendously. You've seen individual programs, and tonight we're only going to begin to pull those interviews out and to make them meaningful in the whole story of the history of the boot heel. Just to mention a few names. Clara Donaldson, Aline Mobley, Josie Langdon, Charlie Baker, Audie Grissom, Odell Craig, Joe Wellman, A.O. Goldsmith, Ophelia Wade, T.A. Brown, Paul Carter, Carlos Williams, Dick Downing, and from other sources like um, uh, Missouri Historical Society and uh, PBS. Tonight, is the first in a series of programs that we hope to bring to you concerning the history of the boot heel. We've enjoyed putting it together, and we hope you enjoy watching. It's difficult to visualize our beautiful boot heel as anything different to what it is today. A broad, level, and extremely productive farming area. In actuality, it lay for centuries as a long, low basin of shallow water, essentially between the St. Francis and the Mississippi rivers, which overflowed into it annually. And it's all what we call made land, Rosemary. What you call what? Made land. What it is, this swamp come in here, the overflow come in, and the water stops and it settles, it settles it down. Just like your black land you see out the gumbo. Yeah. They come from in, in the Dakotas. You the, know where the, the gumbo? Yeah. The you, gumbo? Know where, you know where the bad lands are in Dakota? Yeah. That's where they come from. Took the, all that land there, come in here, and it settled right here. The gumbo out east of town here. It come from that area. Uh, I wondered, well, where did this area? Place, you can go up there, and when it gets wet, it sticks on you just like this does out here. And then this other land from various other parts of the country come in here, the topsoil, swept in over it. Experimentally, the alluvial deposit is easy to demonstrate. Just dig a shallow hole in an area of virgin soil, and the layers of deposit leap out at you telling a long and an interesting story. But these layers are not all rich and organic. 
the presence of sand and gravel and inert clay betray the fact that geologically the past has not always been kind. A good example of how that happens, if you note this last flood that was this last year that happened up north, you go over that land that went over by the Missouri River there, it just devastated with sand. Just just went over the whole thing and it settled down and there's several five, six feet of sand on ruins of land, that land. You told me that the Ohio brought in uh, yeah, some of this, all right, and all that, that the Mississippi River was the other side of Crow's Ridge. Ridge. Yeah. Where was the St. Francis? Was it St. Francis didn't exist. Okay. The St. Francis occupies the old channel of the Mississippi for part of the way, and the Cash occupies part of the old Mississippi channel. Okay. Uh, they, the Mississippi and Ohio, instead of coming together, together at Carroll like they do now, came together at Helena, Arkansas. Where the St. Francis and the Mississippi yeah. come together now. Yeah. Do you think they diverged uh, or before, like, say, the earthquake? Uh, oh, yeah, Do you no, think really. a long time ago? Well, around 6,000 years ago, they assumed their present arrangement with the Mississippi over here and then high up north. Okay, now what causes it? Do you, do you want to speculate? Oh, Is that an earthquake? Easily known. I mean, it's been thoroughly studied. It's just simply an erosional capture of the... Now, see, that day I learned there was a glacier that came down to mid-Missouri that was probably six miles thick. The eruptions caused by the great New Madrid earthquake of 1812 brought huge volcanoes of sand to the surface. These areas of infertility, called sand blows, have been a bane especially to the ridge sand farmers. In this area, of the New Madrid County earthquake, we have more sand blows than they do anywhere I know of. Now, over in Tennessee, they don't have them. Oh, really? So you don't see none of them over there. Uh, okay. Well, when you get a little further north here, you don't see them either. When you get up now uh, uh, on uh, our farm that we had up for Camel, there wasn't any sand blows. Mm -hmm. But now, okay. that's North Duncan County. But the problem is that it just doesn't produce like the rest of the land, and, and uh, uh, if you get too much, the, the first thing you know, you're dragging it with your towels out into the other dirt, and you're, you're mixing it. And uh, that's the reason why that the, that the lots of, uh, and they would work up. They'd come up and get bigger and bigger each year. The whole area was heavily forested by huge cypress up to six feet in diameter and by monstrous oak up to eight feet in diameter and by many other trees such as walnut and elm. However, early settlers found a few grassy knolls which for some unknown reason remained unforested. From these, Grand Prairie, present-day Carruth, East Prairie to the north, still named so, Little Prairie, Carruthersville, and West Prairie, which is now Malden, took their name. It is surmised that the New Madrid earthquake of 1812 inundated many, many trees. And there at Hollywood, when we lived there, we dug uh, uh, a lot of cypress logs out of the field. We'd see the end of it sticking up, you know, and we didn't want to plow into them. So we'd start digging down there, and we'd dig down as far as 10, 12 feet down in, the, down in there, digging out those solid logs, and that, that uh, uh, wood would be just as solid as uh, nice as it, as it ever was. And they formed, was formed right down uh, from where we used to live down there. And I believe that uh, they dug that log up. It was a chalk cypress. That thing was six foot two, buried from up. They was just hitting it with flies, you know, and kept chipping it off. They found it and they dug it. I think they dug it up. But yeah, they, they timber still in this ground. We dug them up. It was so big that, uh, that a man could stand up at the end of it. You know what I mean? Where we sawed it off, we didn't get the uh, we did the root part of it. We just we go down as far as we could go, and then we saw it off with a crosscut saw. And that, it was and we pull out those blocks. We had to saw off them blocks and hook a team to because it. Because it's buried. Out. Now you're yeah, talking uh, about you yes. dug a trench yeah, down on each side of it. Okay. And uh, they they would be so uh, the blocks would be so big that a man could stand up and in front of them, and then you could see him on the other side of it. During a very recent drainage ditch excavation, uh, shows that the mastodons lived here in the distant past. But this area was sticking out where the where the drag line left it, I guess. 
And I dug, when I dug the dirt back, well, I seen it was her bone. And I asked him, I said, The swamp remained a formidable barrier to travel well into the 20th century. It was virtually impenetrable except by fording, which was a treacherous business. But as the migrants from Tennessee and Kentucky began pouring in to settle the higher areas, through the swamp was the only way to go. Unless, of course, one wanted to travel well to the north then circled back on the ridge which extended from Sykeston southwesterly to Kennett and Zenith, and then on to Cardwell. But even this route was inhibited by difficult swamps. When we go to uh, Dexter, the farmers in the community would all try to get together and, uh, and uh, go on the same trip so that if they ran across any trouble or anything, they could help each other out. So five or six of them would go and they'd leave about noon and go up north of Kennett to Chiller to Call. And Chief Chiller to Call was up there and he... Now the real, this was an Indian yes. village. That, yes. now, now what years are we talking about? Uh, in about 1875 to 1775. Okay, and so there was an Indian village and Chief Chiller to Call. Lived there at that time. Okay, so what would the... And they would stay there on, on the grounds there all night because next morning they wanted their teams to be fresh because they had to go across the slough there over to White Oak. And uh, they had to take, if the it, if it weather was bad, raining or anything, had been raining, they had to take the uh, four mules and put to one wagon and go across and then come back after the other fellow's wagon and go take them across and so forth. And then finally get through, then they don't start out to Dexter. Okay, now when you're now you're saying get across the slough, <laughs> what are we talking about? How deep are uh, the water are we talking about? Well, uh, there was no bridge. A lot of mud and so mud. forth. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and there was no bridges. Or, uh, there might have been some logs and with some poles nailed on it, but uh, uh, for one or two places of the deep water. But there's a hole. You had a lot of just pure mud to go through. Okay, so they'd help each other kind of go in a caravan. That's right. To help each That's other right. through the bad places. That's right. Or, or, okay. And take three days to go to Dexter also. Then they'd bring their bale of cotton back home with them. And when they got three bales of cotton, then uh, they would go to Cape Girarda and take their three bales of cotton. That was the nearest cotton market and sell it. The immediate answer, of course, was the railroad, which penetrated this jungle of mud and water. A great project was proposed to encourage the railroad to build a line down the high ridge between the huge East Swamp and the St. Francis River Swamp. First railroad and the most successful railroad early across the state was the Hannibal St. Joe. Second was the Missouri Pacific. But then there was a railroad that took off from St. Louis and came down called the St. Louis and Iron Mountain Railroad. You have been watching Time for Talk. Time for Talk is a community benefit.